throughout the whole book. Okay, so as we're reading, you're going to be looking for a couple of these themes. Can you move for one? Thank you. All right, there are three main reasons for reading stories. Okay, any book or novel that we have read so far this year falls into one of these three categories. Okay, number one, history or origin. Okay, we talked before about how it's beneficial for us to know the history or kind of the background behind why something happened. And there are some novels and books that uh, we read for that reason. Okay, the next reason we read stories is for entertainment. Okay, it's just a good way to engage our brain, helps us with creative thinking, um, et cetera, et cetera. And then the last reason we read stories is for a moral lesson. There is some kind of um, deeper meaning to what we're reading. Okay, so let's think back to our old book and see which of these categories they fall into. Okay, so of these three categories, where do you think Prince Caspian would fall? Is it a history slash origin novel, giving you background history on something? Is it an entertainment novel, or does it teach you a moral lesson? Brooklyn, what do you think? Entertainment. Entertainment? Raise your hand if you agree. Okay. Who thinks something different? What do you think, Aiden? I think moral okay. Like, like what kind of moral lesson? Don't always just go with the group. Sometimes you've got to do something different in the group. Good. So I would argue that you could kind of say Prince Caspian fits in either one of these, right? It is entertaining. There's not, there's not really any history to it. But there were certainly moral lessons that we learned from it, yes? Okay. Um, what about Don Quixote? History, entertainment, or moral lesson? Layla? Entertainment? I would pro it probably is more entertainment than it is moral lesson. It's definitely not history. Okay? What about Midsummer Night's Dream? Luke? Moral lesson? What kind of moral lesson could you learn from Midsummer Night's Dream? <laughs> Don't play tricks on your wife. Okay, that's a good one. Riley, what do you think? Well, Greece. Okay. And then there is a moral lesson um, with like. Um, <laughs> yeah, there would be. A, there, you can't argue one of any of those, really. Chloe, what do you think? Okay. 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 All right. Oh, let's move on to Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes. Which category do we think here? Connor? Definitely entertainment. And also, the moral of the story of Don Quixote is don't be a really old guy who thinks that he's too young to play you. Yeah, live in, live in the reality, right, not the fantasy. Um, I would say that Sherlock Holmes does fall under entertainment, but I think it's a different kind of entertainment than maybe Midsummer Night's Dream or Don Quixote, right? Yeah. Sherlock Holmes is a little more entertaining as in you got to kind of engage your brain. We didn't laugh as much in Sherlock Holmes. There were some times. But we were really more like kind of on the edge of our seat trying to figure out what happened next, right? Still entertaining, but not quite the same kind of entertainment, okay? Uh, let's see, Little Women. Aimee? You know, I would say it's more moral lesson than entertainment. Yes, it's entertaining, and it gave us a little bit of history, right? Kind of like what, uh, what was proper, what was life kind of, what was expected of women and boys back then. Um, but really, there were almost every chapter, there was some kind of good moral lesson, either from Marmy or from Lori or from Joe or from Meg, any of them. Yes? Oh, I would say the uh, moral lesson would be Don Quixote is the only makes your life harder. Yeah, it only makes your life harder. Definitely. That could be one of them. Okay, but my point is this. In Frederick Douglass, the main reason that we read this story, raise your hand if you think it's for a moral lesson. Yes. 
Ray Jennings for entertainment. Ray Jennings is for historical or origin. Yes. Good. It is mostly so we can get an idea of what history was like back then, but it also does teach us quite a few moral lessons. Okay? Ms. Jennings, can you go forward one? All right. When Frederick Douglass wrote this book, you have to understand. Keep going. You have to understand that these that the book was written for a few reasons. Number one, it was written before the Civil War started. Okay, we discussed how the Civil War was uh, the battle between North and South America, North United States and Southern United States, um, over mainly the issue of slavery. Okay, so that was kind of one reason he wanted to give his readers an idea of what slavery was like before they decided which side they wanted to be on. Okay. Next reason he wrote it was specifically for the northerner. Okay, you can go for a little more. Okay. Specifically, he wanted to write down his personal experience with slavery. I should be up here, not about anything else. Pens and pencils should not be moving. Specifically, he wanted to convince them that slavery was evil by showing them the horrors of his life. And he did not hold back. Okay. He told every detail in its gruesome entirety for the purpose of allowing people to see this is really how evil slavery is. Okay? Keep going. The main question that we're going to be kind of asking throughout this book, what is he trying to tell us? Okay? The, like I told you, the book is rough. Okay? It is pretty graphic. It's pretty intense. But I want you to be thinking, what is he trying to tell us? Why is he explaining to me about uh, Mr. Covey and how he was like a snake in the garden. And why is he telling me about how his mother only saw him a few times when he was a child? Why is he telling me that he doesn't know when his birthday is? Why is he telling me all these things? Okay? Keep asking yourself that question. Why is he telling me what he's telling me? Why is he including this part of the story? And then lastly, you can just put all this. All right. A couple of things to think about. Okay? The treatment of people. In this story, I want you to think, are the people being treated as people or are they being treated as animals? Okay? And you'll see that the way that they treated these slaves as far as chaining them together, selling them at the auction, things like that, they really were treated more like animals or objects than people with true feelings. Okay? Um, what things are they not given that many of us have today? Be thinking about not not our hands right now, but be thinking about it as we read. And then I also want you to see how do the masters become worse themselves? How do their quote unquote insides change? Meaning their hearts, their spirit. You'll see that at, the older the slave master is, the longer he has had control over slaves. Typically, the more evil he is. Okay. So how how does how does their inside person, their soul or their heart change? the more they're in control of these slaves, okay? And then lastly, we're going to see a little bit about education. Obviously, you should know that slaves did not receive an education, right? They didn't get to go to school. Uh, in fact, we even read in the picture book story that Frederick Douglass was taught how to read by one of his uh, master's wives, but his master told his wife to stop teaching him how to read. So they were denied the opportunity to read. It was not uncommon for a slave to go through their entire life without being able to read or write. Entire life. Birth to death. Couldn't read, couldn't write. Okay? So, why does Frederick Douglass think that education is important? Once he learns how to read, once he learns um, how to think for himself, once he has a little bit of knowledge, how does it change Frederick Douglass as a person? And then in turn, why should we be thankful that we get to have an education? Okay? Does that make sense? So we're asking, what is he trying to tell us? How are the slaves treated as animals or objects? How do the masters become worse? And then what's the importance of education? Make sense? Okay. Now I want you to turn in your book. Not to page one. Prior to page one, there are some Roman numeral pages. Okay? You want to turn to little x, little i, little x. Okay?
Okay. All righty, here we go. Historical background, slavery and the slaves. I'm going to start reading and kind of see how it goes. Uh, I will also tell you that this book is very difficult to understand if you don't stay with me, okay? The particular um, words and phrases and gr grammar that they use are pretty advanced, so we're going to pause a lot, okay? So I can kind of pause and explain with you. Make sense? Okay. What is slavery? This is a quote from Frederick Douglass. We were all ranked together, men and women, old and young, married and single. We were ranked with horses, sheep, and swine, which is a fancy word for pigs. There were horses and men, cattle and women, pigs and children, all holding the same rank in the scale of being. Basically meaning the horses, men, cattle, women, pigs, and children were all seen equally as important. They were treated the same, seen equally as important. That's so sad. The above quotation offers some sense of the dehumanizing effects of slavery, a practice that is older than human civilization and that continues in some parts of the world to this day, despite its extreme barbarity. Okay, Barbarity meaning this is um, uh, barbaric. Right? Almost like it's a common word used among pirates, but this is just purely evil. Absolutely barbaric. Okay? Slavery in the United States had its own particular characteristics, but all forms of slavery are the same in that one group of people essentially exercises unrestricted control over another. They control every aspect of that person's life. When they wake up, what they eat, how much they get to eat, how many clothes they get to wear, when they go to bed, what days they get a break and what days they don't, how much work they have to get done. If they don't get that much work, then they get whipped. All, all these things. They basically control whether a slave lives or dies. Okay? One of the most conspicuous aspects of slavery is its sheer physical brutality. It was really, really tough on the person's body. As Douglas pointed out, even when slave masters began their careers with relatively generous natures, they themselves became dehumanized. The institution made them increasingly cruel. The longer they had control of slaves, the less nice of a person they became. They became more and more and more cruel. Speaking of one of his mistresses, Mrs. Hughes, Douglas wrote that under slavery's influence, her tender heart became stone and the lamb-like disposition gave way to one of tiger-like fierceness. So what kind of animal did she start like? A lamb, which is gentle, soft, and sweet, wouldn't hurt anybody. What kind of animal did she end up as? A tiger. Do you see the difference? Okay. Why? Because absolute power corrupts absolutely. This one, this line right here, you're going to see that theme throughout the book. Absolute power corrupts someone absolutely. Okay? Every single part of them is messed up when they have absolute control over every aspect of a person's life. Yes? Then they get worse. Worse than you can even possibly imagine. Uh, that was very, very, very rare. I mean, it, could, it was possible, but it was very rare. There were. Mm -hmm. But I will say that after Frederick Douglass uh, published this book, there were many people, including um, I don't know if it was Thomas Jefferson, or including even some people in government that had slaves, that actually released their slaves once they read this book because they realized this is ridiculous. Even though they didn't necessarily act like the people in this book, the points he made in here made them feel so guilty about it that they actually freed their slaves. Okay, I can't stop right now because we got to keep going. Okay. 
The desire of slave owners to maintain their dominance gave rise to a multitude of dreadful torture devices and perverse practices. The whip was the most common tool of the master or overseer. Its shrill crack echoed in the ears of victims and witnesses for years afterward. Whipping left the skin permanently scarred and sometimes led to death. Physical punishment was but one of the tortures inflicted upon a slave. The mere memory of a severe beating, or even witnessing the beating of another slave, haunted the slave for the rest of his life, dulled the emotions and senses, and sometimes left him a mere shell of a human being. Constant hard labor, lack of decent food, and poor living conditions also had emotional, physical, and spiritual impact. Then there was the threat of separation from family and friends, and the uncertainty as to what hardship the next day might bring. Given the toll that slavery usually took on its victim, it is altogether an astonishing testament to the human spirit that a person like Frederick Douglass could endure its worst and still emerge a strong, free, and rational man. Perhaps as you learn more about slavery, you will recognize all the privileges and freedoms that we so often take for granted today, and be thankful that, no matter how hard you try, you can only begin to imagine the horror of living in hopeless bondage and servitude. And perhaps well, as well, you can take courage yourself from Douglas's example. Here truly was a person unabowed and unafraid. The Transatlantic Slave Trade. If nothing else, guys, from reading this book, take note of how many blessings and things you have to be thankful for. Okay? This book is very humbling in a sense because many of the things that I complain about or that I gripe or complain or whine about every day would be like, it seems like inky winky dinky compared to his, the concerns they had as slaves. You see what I'm saying? If nothing else, Realize how many things you, how blessed you are and how thankful you should be for what you do have. Okay. The transatlantic slave trade. We mentioned this before uh, in the age of exploration. We talked about, about slave trade, but we'll get a little more in depth here. Slavery began in the Western Hemisphere in the early 1500s. As soon as Spanish adventurers began combing the New World for its expected catches of gold, silver, and other riches. Early Spanish settlers in the Caribbean and South America exploited native Arawak and Carib Indian populations in order to satisfy their labor needs, and these groups were rapidly annihilated by disease and hardship. Pause. This is when, remember how we talked about, um, not Pablo Picasso, what's the guy's name? Pedro Alvarez? No. Uh, Pizarro, that's his name. Pizarro and uh, Cortez, when they came over to Central America, and they took over the Aztecs and the Incas and all those guys, right? They captured them and then put them to work. That was one of the first examples of slavery. Well, not at first, but one example of slavery, okay? They took over the people's nation, forced them to work for themselves, and then because of their close interaction, remember that they had the transfer of germs and then the Indians died a lot because they didn't have the immune system to fight it, okay? That's what we're talking about here. By the early 1520s, the Spanish turned to Africa where Portuguese traders had long ago established ties to existing slave markets along the continent's western coast. Large-scale transatlantic shipments of African slaves increased sharply in the late 16th century with the development of sugar and tobacco plantations in Brazil, Jamaica, and San Domingue. Later, Cuba was also home to an immense plantation system as were other parts of the British and French West Indies. Through the mid-1800s, however, Brazil would prove to be by far the single largest importer of African slaves, absorbing more than 60% of all forced migrants from Africa to the Western Hemisphere. So, here's what we talked about here. Remember the Middle Passage? Okay. We mentioned in history how the Europeans would take their goods, their raw goods, okay, or their manufactured goods, transport them to Africa, trade the goods for slaves, for African people. They would then load up the African slaves on the boat, 
take them across the middle passage where many of them died because of the conditions they lived in while on the boat. In America, they would trade the slaves for raw goods, cotton, tobacco, corn, sugar cane, things like that. Then they would take the raw goods back to Europe and use them to manufacture more um, trade items, clothing, textiles, uh, fabrics, and things like that. Then they would do it again. They would come to West Africa, trade the fabrics and textiles for slaves, and so on and so forth. Okay? Yes. Um, they could, but most they mostly went over to this to the New World because here this is where they needed all the workers to help look for search for riches and gold, farm the plantation, etc. Yes. Jacob? Okay, we'll make it fast. <laughs> slave traders developed a route known as the triangle trade wherein african slaves were traded in the americas for raw materials sugar molasses timber tobacco and cotton which in turn were shipped to europe for consumption or processed into manufactured goods these goods were used to purchase more slaves in africa completing the triangle and beginning the process anew Many slaves were prisoners of war or victims of raids perpetrated by rival tribes who swapped their human commodities for textiles, guns, and other European goods. By the end of the transatlantic slave trade in the mid-19th century, as many as 12 million Africans had been sold into slavery and transported to the Western Hemisphere. Of these, approximately 10 million survived the wretched journey across the Atlantic. Okay, so back up here. In total, there were 12 million slaves taken from here to here. Two million of those 12 million died on the way. Okay? For reasons that we're going to talk about here in just a minute. Known commonly as the Middle Passage, the trip from Africa to the Americas lasted anywhere from a few weeks to months, depending on the point of embarkation and the final destination. Okay? So the trip from here to here could take anywhere from a few weeks to a few months depending on where you were leaving from and where you were going. Most slave ships were relatively small merchant vessels that transported 100 to 300 slaves. But large ships, capable of carrying as many as 1,000 slaves, were not unusual. Violent mutiny was a constant threat aboard any slave ship, and history records hundreds of such events. Remember, mutiny is when the people on board try to take over from the captain, right? So if you're transporting a thousand slaves on your boat, but you only have a hundred crew members, they very much outnumber you, correct? Yeah. So the threat of mutiny was real. They could easily overtake the men who were the captain on board, but they put a few things in place to keep that from happening. Watch how they tried to keep control of the slaves on the ship. Crews took every precaution to prevent uprisings with swift and severe punishment for rebellious slaves. Frederick Douglass was born in the U.S., so he did not experience the journey from Africa. For first-hand details of the Middle Passage, we must turn to other slave narratives, one of the most famous of which is by Olada Ekiano, a Nigerian sold into slavery at the age of 11. In the following passage, Ekiano describes being beaten because he refused his food, probably because he was too sick to eat. Okay? So, any sort of thing where the slave did, did not do what the captain of the ship told him to, he was beaten for. Okay? So in this instance, the guy was probably too sick to eat. He may have been nauseous. He may have had a cold. He may have had the flu. Whatever it may be. And he kind of was like, no, I don't want to eat that. I don't feel good. And he was beaten for it. Okay? Because any sign of the slave saying no to the captain had to be whipped right away. Otherwise, the rest of the slaves thought they could also come against the captain. You see what I'm saying? They had to kind of cut it off right away. Now, listen to what else he writes. This is, o this is Okeano, the guy who actually sailed on the boat as a slave. Soon to my grief, two of the white men offered me eatables, and on my refusing to eat them, one of them held me fast by the hands and laid me across the windlass and tied my feet 
while the other flogged me severely, meaning whipped. So one person held him down while the other guy whipped him. I had never experienced anything of this kind before. If I could have gotten over the netting, meaning if I could have jumped overboard, I would have jumped over the side, but I could not. The crew used to watch very closely those of us who were not chained down to the deck, lest we should leap into the water. Okay? Now, here's the thing. If you're a slave trader, all the slaves you pick up in Africa, you want to get to America so you can sell and make money, right? If your slaves start jumping overboard, you're not going to be able to sell them, right? So they would keep very close eye on the slaves, not because they didn't want them to commit suicide and jump over the board of the ship, but because they wanted to make money off of them. You see the difference? They would keep a close eye to make sure none of them would jump overboard, not because they cared if they died, but because they cared if they were able to get their money. That's really weird. Yes. Correct. Any ones that were not actually like chained to the ship and locked in. Okay. Now, the conditions on board a slave vessel, especially one of the large ones, are virtually unimaginable for modern minds. Listen to how horrible this was. According to Echiano, the closeness of the place and the heat of the climate added to the number of people on the ship was so crowded that each of us had scarcely room to turn himself around, and it almost suffocated us. Imagine this room being so packed, no air conditioning, you're below deck on a ship so it's humid and sticky, and you don't even have enough room to turn around. You had to travel like that for months. The air became unfit for respiration, meaning you, could not, you couldn't even breathe the air because of a variety of loathsome smells. Imagine what kind of smells that would be. And brought on a sickness among the slaves, of which many of them died. Okay? There's no bathroom. There's no trash cans. There's no showering. Okay? Absolutely horrible. Slaves were usually kept in the cargo hold, where chains were available for the unruly, if not for the entire population. Traders often modified their cargo holds in order to use every inch of space, allowing perhaps four feet of headroom for the slaves. Thus, slaves led a nightmarish existence in the dark, stuffy cargo hold, awash in human waste, bathroom waste, blood, and general misery. As the journey wore on, supplies on board the ships dwindled, and sickness became rampant, resulting in increased death rates among slaves and crew alike. Slavery in the English colonies in the U.S. English colonies, and later in the United States, imported only about 5% of all African slaves. Early on, the English relied on indentured servants in colonies like Virginia and Barbados. These were usually young men who had agreed to work, essentially as slaves, for several years in return for passage, housing, and food. As riches from the New World were transferred overseas, the economies and opportunities in Europe improved, and the pool of willing indentured servants dried up. This development, together with a soaring worldwide demand for sugar and cotton, caused planters in the English colonies to follow the lead of their counterparts in the Caribbean and South America to meet their labor needs. So, originally, the farms in North America did not have slaves. They had indentured servants. People that volunteered and said, hey, if you'll let me sail with you from Europe to America, I'll work for you for three years. If you give me a place to stay, feed me, and let me sail on your boats. I can't afford to go on my own, so if you'll let me come with you, I'll work it off for the next three years. Okay? Well, eventually... Life in Europe got to be so good that those volunteers got less and less and less. They're like, nope, I don't want to go. Thanks, so. though. But the farms over here still needed workers. That was when they started turning to African slave trade. Make sense? However, 
Slavery in North America developed along entirely different lines than it did in Brazil and other points in the Spanish Empire or British or French West Indies. The living conditions in North American colonies were relatively easy compared to those in Brazil, who, where stifling heat, disease, and truly brutal labor practices meant that slaves died almost as quickly in plantations, no, almost as quickly as the plantation owners could import them from Africa. Also, the vast majority, or most, of the slaves that were transported to Brazil and other southern realms were young males, 18 to 30 years old, which left little chance for the development of families should the slaves live long enough or have the desire to do so. This is not to say that life for a slave in an English colony in North America was not miserable or perilous, but that the ratio of male to female slaves was nearly equal in places like Virginia, and daily life allowed an opportunity for slaves to raise families, although the children were the property of the slave owner. Okay, so if I was a slave and my, I had a master, my children were not considered my children. They were the property of my master. And if he wanted to sell them at any point in time, he could, without having to ask me. Terrible. Mm. By the 1770s, fully 80% of slaves in the nascent U.S. were American-born. Okay, we're going to skip that part for now. Let's go. Plantation life in the U.S. Yeah, this is the last part, I think. Question? Go for a morning. Why didn't you go during passing period? Plantation life in the U.S. The average plantation in Georgia, South Carolina, and other southern states held about 50 slaves, though this number could range from just a few slaves to several hundred. Large-scale insurrections were rare, mainly uh, meaning like large-scale slaves fighting back against their master to rebel and take over. It's an insurrection. In part because of the tight restrictions placed on slave movement and communication with neighboring plantations. Although most slave owners did not believe themselves to be over overtly abusive, the established system was nonetheless cruel and inhumane. Slave owners employed a variety of methods, but the whip was the most common tool for administering punishment, or simply letting the slave know who was in charge. Punishments and practices varied from plantation to plantation. Whereas 12 lashes of the whip might be sufficient to one master, another master might see fit to administer a hundred or more for the same offense. It was totally up to the master. Yes. Because absolute power corrupts absolutely. Evil. A slave family's quarters normally consisted of dirt floors, thin walls, and a leaky roof. So the place where they stayed, their house. Enslaved people worked all day, every day. Though in most places they were afforded a little time off on the Sabbath, or on Sundays, and on certain holidays. Food was basic with most slaves receiving a paltry breakfast and an evening meal. No lunch, breakfast, dinner, which they were often too exhausted to prepare or even consume. A slave could sometimes earn wages or make a little money by plying a trade or performing odd jobs. Occasionally, if the master was willing, a slave could even afford to buy his or her own freedom. Such opportunities were very uncommon, however, in the southern states. Perhaps the cruelest aspect of the slavery system was the fact that entire families were the sole property of the plantation owner and could be separated and sold at the master's discretion. This practice was especially brutal because the family was a slave's major refuge from the hardships of life. The importation of slaves from Africa decreased, 
but the demand for slaves continued to rise, especially with the establishment of western slave states like Louisiana and Mississippi. Thus, slave owners and traders became more intent on increasing the number of American-born slaves and less likely to allow slaves to purchase their own freedom. It was not uncommon for a slave owner to get a husband and wife slave, and they had children, right? So a family of slaves, and then at any point in time, they could take one sibling, sell them. Another sibling, sell them. They could take father and son, sell them. And mother and kids were left, okay? And oftentimes, when they were sold, they never saw their family again. Okay? It was a horrible, horrible, horrible practice. Not only that, but the family was one of the main joys the slaves had in their life, right? Their day was horrible. They worked hard. They got whipped. But the one thing they could count on, they could come home to their family. If you took that away, they had nothing. Yeah. Oftentimes they would take, like if, like if they were, like my family, we had four kids in my family, they would, it was not super uncommon for them to split up all four kids and you would never see your family again. Like horrible, horrible, horrible. With the enlargement of the American born slave population came the development of a distinct culture, which included slave religion, music, and folklore, all of which provided some refuge for slaves. When families were split and separated, these elements of culture remained and were passed down through the generations to become vital, enduring components of American civilization. So, one thing to note, uh, we'll get a little bit into this when we get into the history unit, but because of the things that the slaves went through, and remember I told you that they weren't usually educated, they couldn't read or write, what became popular was slave um, songs and stories, Okay. So the slave would be working all day long. They have a hard work day. They would get together at night, and they would kind of gather around the campfire, and they would share stories, maybe stories that they had heard from their uh, family had been passed on down to them. Or they would tell scary stories, or they would tell jokes. They would sing songs together. Why? Well, because they couldn't write them down. They couldn't read or write. All they could do is repeat what was said to them, right? So thus was born this culture of, um, we'll read uh, Br'er Rabbit and the Tar Baby. Um, or some of the other ones. Well, I, I, I like I can't remember. But we'll read some of them actually in class. Mm -hmm. Okay? But that was kind of the other way they found some joy in their life. All right, so that's kind of our history of slavery. We'll go ahead and start chapter one, but we won't be able to finish it. Okay, so this is chapter one. We're going to start. Don't forget that when he says I, he is speaking as Frederick Douglass the slave. Okay, so this is all written in first person, like a diary. Yes. Chapter one. I was born in Tuckahoe near Hillsboro about 12 miles from Easton in Talbot County, Maryland. I have no accurate knowledge of my age, never having seen my authentic record containing it. Okay, stop right there. He has no idea how old he is. Why? Because he has never, ever, ever in his life seen a document stating when he was born. So he can guess, but he has no idea when his birthday is. By far, the, largest, the larger part of the slaves know as little of their ages as horses know of their ages. And it is the wish of most masters, within my knowledge, to keep their slaves thus ignorant. Okay, this is what I'm telling you. It's kind of fancy language. I'm going to pause, and I will explain it, but you've got to stay with me, okay? The masters would want them to not know their age. Okay? They it would, again, just kind of make them more reliant on the slave master. Okay? I do not remember ever having met a slave who could tell of his birthday. They seldom come nearer to it than planting time, harvest time, cherry time, springtime, or fall time. So you could kind of say, uh, my birthday's, I got a fall time birthday, or I have a springtime birthday. 
or I have a summer birthday, but they had no idea. April 10th? No, they had no idea. A want of information concerning my own was a source of unhappiness to me even during my childhood. He really wanted to know when his birthday was. The white children could tell their ages. I could not tell why I ought to be deprived of the same privilege. I was not allowed to make any inquiries of my master concerning it. Was he allowed to ask what, when his birthday was? Yeah. He deemed all such inquiries on the part of the slave improper and impertinent, and evidence of a restless spirit. What does impertinent mean at the bottom of that page? Chloe? Very good. Not necessary. You don't need to know. The nearest estimate I can give makes me now between 27 and 28 years of age. I come to this from hearing my master say, sometime during 1835, that I was about 17 years old. My mother was named Harriet Bailey. She was the daughter of Isaac and Betsy Bailey, both colored and quite dark. My mother was of a darker complexion than either my grandmother or grandfather. My father was a white man. He was admitted to be such by all I ever heard speak of my parentage. He has no idea who his father is. He just knows that he has heard somewhere that it's a white man. The opinion was also whispered that my master was my father. But of the correctness of this opinion, I, do not, I know nothing. The means of knowing whether who my father was was withheld from me. My mother and I were separated when I was but an infant, before I even knew her as my mother. It's a common custom in the part of Maryland from which I ran away to part children from their mothers at a very early age. Frequently, before the child has even reached its twelfth month, before he turns one year old, its mother is taken from it and hired out on some farm a considerable distance off, and the child is placed under the care of an old woman, too old for field labor. For what this separation is done, meaning why they separate mothers from children, I do not know, unless it be to hinder the development of the child's affection toward its mother, and to blunt and destroy the natural affection of the mother for the child. This is the inevitable result. Okay? Basically what this means is this. He's like, the only reason I can think of that they would want to separate a one-year-old baby from its mother is so the baby doesn't learn to love the mother and the mother doesn't learn to love the baby. That way, if they ever get separated later in life, it's not as big of a deal. So before it's even one year old, they sell the mother and the baby stays at the farm. Mm -hmm. I never saw my mother to know her as such, more than four or five times in my whole life. And each of these times I did see her was very short in duration, and it was at night. She was hired by a man named Mr. Stewart, who lived about 12 miles from my house. She made her journeys to see me at the night, traveling the whole distance on foot, all 12 miles, after the performance of her whole day's work. She was a field hand. And a whipping is the penalty of not being in the field at sunrise, unless a slave has special permission from his or her master on the contrary. A permission which they seldom get, and one that gives to him that gives it the proud name of being a kind master. I do not recollect of ever seeing my mother by the light of day. She was with me in the night. She would lie down with me and get me to sleep, but long before I woke up, she was gone. Why would she leave so early in the morning? Matthew? So, two things. One, she would leave really early in the morning. Um, so, um, so she could get back. On she had to get back before sunrise, or she'd be whipped. And she was walking 12 miles on foot. In a night. And, like, if I was a master, then I would be very, very kind to my slave. And I would probably give them a clock or a watch, mm -hmm. and I and um I'd let them uh go and I'd let them be back. Um, uh, they have and they'd have to and they'd work from uh I'd probably have them work from eight a from eight a.m. to six p.m. Okay. And then they could do whatever they wanted.
still ten hours. It's still much less than what they probably seems have. to be. Probably at five a.m. Very little communication ever took place between us. Death soon ended what little communication we could have while she lived, and with it ended her hardships and suffering. She died when I was about seven years old on one of my master's farms near Lee's Mill. I was not allowed to be present during her illness, at her death, or at her burial. She was gone long before I knew anything about it. Never having enjoyed to any considerable extent her soothing presence, her tender and watchful care, I received the tidings of her death with much the same emotions I should have probably felt at the death of a stranger. Get that. When he was told that his mother died, he knew he knew her so barely that he was like, okay. He It was like the way he felt finding out that his mother had died is the way we would feel finding out that a stranger had died. Sad. Okay. Wow. That, that is the effect of having separated him from his mother so young in age. Horrible. Horrible. Called thus suddenly away, she left me without the slightest intimation of who my father was. The whisper that my master was my father may or may not be true. And... True or false, it is of but little consequence to my purpose whilst the fact remains, in all its glaring odiousness, that slaveholders have ordained, and by law established, that the children of slave women shall in all cases follow the condition of their mothers. And this is done too obviously to administer to their own lust, and make a gratification of their wicked desires profitable as well as pleasurable. I'm going to explain this one. For by this cunning arrangement, the slaveholder, in cases not a few, sustains to have his slaves the double relation of master and father. Okay? The double relationship is this. Sometimes the slave master would have children with the slave women. Okay? And those women, those children were then, literally they were his children. Okay? But they were also his slaves. Okay? So yes, biologically it was his son, but he treated it more like a slave. Okay. That's so sad. Like, I, can't, I can't imagine my dad being that way. Mm -hmm. I know of such cases. And it is worthy of remark that such slaves invariably suffer greater hardship and have more to contend with than others. These men, the ones that have their the, the master as their father and slave owner, these slaves are, in the first place, a constant offense to their mistress. She is ever disposed to find fault with them. They can seldom do anything to please her. She is never better pleased than when she sees them under the lash, especially when she suspects her husband of showing to his mulatto children favors which he withholds from his black slaves. The master is frequently compelled to sell this class of his slaves out of deference to the feelings of his white wife. And, cruel as the deed may strike anyone to be, for a man to sell his own children to human fleshmongers, it is often the dictate of humanity for him to do so. For unless he does sell them, he must not only whip them himself, but he must stand by and see one white son tie up his brother, but uh, of but few shades darker complexion than himself, and ply the gory lash to his naked back. And if he lists one word of disapproval, it is set down to his parental partiality and only makes a bad matter worse, both for himself and the slave whom he would protect and defend. All right, let me explain. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to use that. This will be our last part. We're going to be done. You have to wait. Okay? You have the slave master. We'll draw him as like kind of an angry guy. Okay? Mm -hmm. You have the slave master. He has his own wife, right? This is the mistress. That's his white wife, the woman that he's married to, not a slave at all. Okay, just his wife. This is master and mistress. Okay? Then you have below them, they have the slaves, right? Okay? So this would be like the slave woman's. 
Her daughter is sad because Blade is normally sad. Okay. This was a slave woman. The master and mistress, they had their own children, right? They would have little sons, daughters, whatever. Okay. Well, sometimes color. the slave master and the slave woman would have children. Okay. Which this child was called a mulatto slave. Okay. Because this child ended up being more of a light-skinned black man or woman. Right? Because you have a mix of the, of the black-skinned woman and the white-skinned man. Making more of like just a lighter-skinned individual. You following? Okay. This, he was called a mulatto slave. And it was very obvious who he was because he looked different than all the other slaves. Right? But this guy, this poor, poor guy, was treated terribly. Why? Because, number one, the mistress hated him. Because it was her husband's son, but it was not her son. You see? She hated the mulatto slave. Not only that, but if the master showed any partiality at all to the mulatto slave, let's say something bad was happening to the, to the mulatto slave. Okay, he's getting whipped. And the master says, okay, that's enough. No more. Showing that he actually does care about that slave, he would be treated even worse. Okay? He could not show at all that he had any feelings for his, literally his son. Mm -hmm. Not only that, but if one of his older sons grew up and got in control of the farm, and he was in control of him, let's say one day this guy gets in trouble, his son has to whip his other son. And he has to watch while one son literally whips this son into a bloody mess. And he can't say a word. If he does, the mistress usually got so upset she would sell the mulatto slave. Yes. Well, it was either he fought with her all day long or he took care of the problem. And not only that, but all the other regular slaves hated the mulatto slave because they felt like he was, like, the the favored child or the special one because his father was the actual master. Typically not. But they had to be, like, extra hard. It's kind of like, have you ever watched a movie where um, the dad is the coach of the team and his son's on the team? Yeah. And he's, like, extra hard on his son? Okay? It's kind of like that. Okay? The slave master was extra hard on the mulatto slave because he had to prove that he didn't didn't love them any more than anybody else. He would go overboard being harsh with them. Okay? Yeah. Really, really sad. So, we'll go ahead and stop there for today. We can pick up tomorrow.